Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you guys with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Okay, happy Thursday, everybody. It's been a tough last few years on the weather front for China. We remember last year, historic heat waves caused severe drought across many regions of the south. In the southwest of the country, especially, rivers reached such low levels that for periods of time, some cities could not use their hydropower stations. In 2021, the price of coal jumped higher than the regulated price at which utilities could sell electricity generated from coal. Causing shortages at that time too. Now, a cold snap that began last week has caused temperatures in parts of China to plunge to record lows, threatening energy supplies in key northern regions. Yesterday, we mentioned the temperature in Mohe, a city in northeast China's Heilongjiang province, dropping to minus 53 degrees Celsius on Sunday. The lowest China has ever measured. Today, several cities measured record low local temperatures too, according to the National Meteorological Center. On Wednesday, yesterday, Beijing recorded a temperature of minus 22.4 degrees Celsius. The same day, regional authorities issued dozens of warnings about high winds, frost, and low temperatures, and now a shortage of natural gas, which is used widely across China to heat homes and businesses. Is affecting tens of millions of people in the freezing north, a state of affairs made worse by the fact that large parts of China are still weathering the first wave of COVID infections. Quote: The crunch has exposed systemic weaknesses in China's energy regulations and infrastructure, while showing the reach of the global market turmoil provoked last year by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. End quote. Part of the problem has also been that many localities, in order to meet the costs of maintaining zero COVID while experiencing tight fiscal conditions, have reduced customary subsidies for natural gas consumption that used to keep a lid on heating bills. Earlier this month, Beijing told local governments to provide more heat. But did not provide the funding to pay for it. This issue has been anticipated for several weeks now. In the first week of January, the State Council held an executive meeting, chaired by Premier Li Keqiang, during which time it expressed, "quote It is imperative to meet people's needs for medical care as well as winter heating." End quote. It was about this time that we really started to see an upcoming energy squeeze. Chinese financial media outlet Caixin, in the first week of January, for example, reported that in the northern province of Hebei, population 75 million, several regions were out of gas already. That same week, another report claimed that a heating company in a northeastern city was turning off heat because the local government had stopped paying them. By the second week of January, the vice chairman of the National Development and Reform Commission told reporters at a special press event, "Quote: Some localities and enterprises have not implemented measures to ensure the supply and price of energy for people's livelihood." End quote. Another part of this problem is regulatory. This winter, natural gas prices are approximately three times the levels that distributors are allowed to charge residential customers, and Chinese regulators strictly limit the price at which municipal and township gas distributors are allowed to sell gas to households. Quote, distributors are allowed to pass along extra costs to industrial and business users of gas. But not to individuals. So when prices rise, the companies have a big incentive to cut off homes and sell mostly to industrial and commercial users. End quote. Fortunately, the worst of this current cold snap is forecast to pass in the next few days. However, even a regular winter is a tough season to weather, when households cannot heat their own homes. Next up, the Chinese economy. Hey guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to hit that like button. And as always, anyone who can go the extra mile and help me keep this channel sustainable, be part of the community that allows me to produce these every day. Patreon and Buy Me a Coffee links are in the description below. Thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. We are receiving more promising preliminary data on economic activity during the Lunar New Year period. Signs of possible recovery after a long and painful zero COVID. 
Consumption, especially, is being closely watched as a barometer of economic recovery for the country. According to Bloomberg calculations from data released by the Ministry of Transport this week, about 95.9 million trips were made by road, rail, air and waterways during the first four days of the week-long public holiday, which started last Saturday. A daily average of 24 million trips, which is much better than the 18.6 million trips seen during the same period last year. According to online travel agency Trip.com, hotel booking levels are almost at pre-pandemic levels this week. The box office performance is looking optimistic too. During the first four days of the holiday, the box office pulled in 3.62 billion yuan, about half a billion US dollars. Not only higher than last year, but higher than 2019 levels. These are all positive signs of renewed consumption. The trillion dollar question, of course, remains, how long will it last? Next up, Derek Scissors, senior fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, who has long written on China and its economy, has published a new report on China's global investment and construction trends, now that it is finally putting the pandemic behind it. The report argues that, quote, One change is China's government is no longer pretending COVID was good for investment. More importantly, genuine activity could rise sharply, end quote. It argues that commodities are an obvious target, but, quote, Chinese priorities in 2023 could also be politically determined. Firms will return to countries where they are wanted and that Beijing sees as most important, end quote. It is worth looking at some of the key conclusions and thinking of this report. Quote, in 2022 alone, Chinese investment fell 14% to 42 billion, basically back to the 2020 level. This fits the country's economic performance, which improved in 2021, only to be blasted by zero COVID policies, then COVID itself in 2022. As expected, given work suspensions in partner countries and Chinese travel restrictions, construction activity plunged in 2020. It recovered somewhat in 2021, but not to pre-pandemic levels. Construction takes longer to confirm than investment does, so 2022 is not yet complete, but results to date show smaller, more numerous transactions than in 2021. It's construction where the Belt and Road Initiative, BRI, stands out. 380 billion invested and more than 540 billion built since the BRI's inception in 2013. In contrast, verifiable Chinese investment in the US has become minor, at barely over $10 billion combined from 2019 to 2022. End quote. And finally, and just briefly, we need to touch on one more development. UK-based Financial Times is reporting today that Chinese migrant workers demanding overdue wages from their employers are facing a crackdown by local governments over alleged malicious labor activism. The outlet writes that more than a dozen cities across China have, in recent weeks, threatened to punish workers who take so-called extremist measures Quote, such as protests blocking traffic or outside government offices to get the money they are owed, end quote. In addition, Chinese financial media reports suggest that even very mild behavior has been restricted in some localities. For example, police in a small county in eastern China's Shandong province arrested five laborers for simply reporting payment delays to provincial government offices. After the arrest, the local police posted a notice online stating, quote, Filing complaints to the upper-level government agencies is absolutely unacceptable. Such behavior disrupts social order, end quote. In recent weeks, we have seen many reports of payment delays, especially from actors in the real estate development sector and COVID-19 testing providers. China has also seen several high-profile labor protests in recent months, protests which appear to be spooking local officials. We remember, for example, earlier this month, hundreds of blue-collar workers clashed with local police at a COVID test kit maker factory after they were forced to take unpaid leave. Quote, According to labor lawyers, the campaign to suppress worker unrest reflects local government's determination to support employers, their biggest sources of fiscal revenues, as they attempt to revive growth in the world's second largest economy. End quote. What one labor lawyer based in Chongqing expressed to the outlet on this matter 
reveals just how bad the fiscal conditions have become in some localities. Quote, Until local businesses are able to support themselves, local governments will not be able to support themselves. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. Wherever you are, I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I will see you all tomorrow.